Oh, there's another friend. Morning. All right, so hopefully I'm going to talk for two hours. You get a 10-minute break halfway through, and hopefully you're going to learn something new and exciting. Seeing all my friends, Jesus. I'm nervous. <laughs> so this is going to be a quick overview. It's uh, going to be a lot of topics. Um, virology, the transmission, epidemiology, pathogenesis, symptoms, diagnosis, management, and prevention. And it's a lot of slides. And I know, remember back in medical school, all y'all want to know is what's going to be in the exam. All right? So I'll try to focus on some of that and teach you something in the process. All right? I'll point out on each slide. Some slides will have a lot of information, but I'll point out on it what you should be thinking about. Hepatitis is a huge problem in the United States. 47% uh, of the cases are hepatitis A, about 34% hepatitis B, and 16% has hepatitis non-ABC, and about 3% or so hep C. Um, the, this slide and about the following two slides really is a summary that if you listen to what I'm going to say right now and you fall asleep for the next hour, in these three slides you'll probably have all the information you need to know about hepatitis, A, B, C, D, and E. All right? Hint, hint. Um, so let's start with hepatitis A. It's a virus, of course, most commonly found in the feces. The route of transmission is fecal oral. There's no chronic infection associated with hepatitis A. And the primary way to prevent it is to wash your hands, all right? There's also pre- and post-exposure immunization. I'm going to go through each of those points on subsequent slides. For hepatitis B, the source of the virus is blood-derived body fluids. The route of transmission is percutaneous or permucosal. It is associated with a chronic infection, and the primary prevention is pre- and post-exposure immunization, as well as risk behavior modification. For hepatitis C, very similar to hepatitis B, it's also blood or body fluid derived. The route of transmission is percutaneous, permucosal. It's also chronic, associated with a chronic infection. Uh, Prime prevention is blood donor screening. Um, hepatitis B is extremely rare now in, um, if you were to receive a blood transfusion. And risk behavior modification will assist with that. Um, skipping to hepatitis uh, D, they were similar to B and C in terms of um, route of transmission and chronic infection. It also has a pre-post exposure immunization, which is in fact hepatitis B. Hepatitis E, similar to hepatitis A, is associated with fecal oral transmission. There is no chronic infection, and it's most commonly found in water that's unclean in foreign countries, not the United States. So hepatitis A, B, C at a glance, and they top row here. I'm going to go through whether it's been transmitted, can be transmitted by sex, intravenous drug use, which is IDU, transfusion, fecal oral, occupational, course of infection, and does protective immunity develop. So you can see for hepatitis A, yes, can be transmitted by sexual activity. Yes for hepatitis B, but very low for hepatitis C. Regarding intravenous drug use, very low for hepatitis A, very high for hepatitis B, and low, and um, high, sorry, for hepatitis C. Transfusions, low for A, low for B, low for C, and the reason for that is because the blood supply is screened for these viruses. Regarding fecal oral transmission, very high for hepatitis A, none for hepatitis B, and none for C. Occupational risk, particularly for healthcare workers, the things we have to think about definitely is hepatitis B and possibly hepatitis C. But most or the majority of healthcare workers have been vaccinated or should be vaccinated for hepatitis B. Course of infection, hepatitis A, usually acute and then gets resolved. For hepatitis B and C, you can develop a chronic infection, but for hepatitis A, uh, hepatitis B, the chronic infection is more likely if you're young, in infants, and it decreases as you get older. For hepatitis C, there's a very high risk of developing a chronic infection. It's about 75 to 85% in adults. You can get protective immunity from hepatitis A and B, but not for hepatitis C, and a vaccine is available for A and B. Okay, don't fall asleep quite yet. <laughs> this slide is also important. It's the age of infection. If you notice, for hepatitis A, it's most common during childhood. Children eat dirt and just about everything they come across, right? 
Hepatitis B is more common during adolescent, and hepatitis C is more common acquisition as a, an adult. I sort of threw this slide in just to give you an idea of the estimates of acute and chronic disease burden. It, you know, don't memorize the numbers. It just gives you an idea of which disease causes more problem in the United States. And this is another way of illustrating the importance of the different hepatic viruses. A and B, you notice vaccine preventable and the number of annual diseases in 2001. So they're huge problems. So you'll definitely, when you get on the wards or start practicing, will encounter hepatitis. That's what it looks like on the electron micrograph. That's what it looks like in a drawing. As a capsid here, it's a single-strand RNA virus. It's a picarnivirus. And I know you guys have gotten this some way back in the past in medical school, so I won't belabor the point, but it's, a, it's an RNA virus and humans are the only reservoir. And that's good because if humans are the only reservoir, it means making a vaccine against it is very easy. Okay, so here are the routes of transmission. It's fecal oral, close personal contact, so household contact, sex contact, child daycare centers, contaminated food and water, or blood exposure, which is rare because blood is screened now, but certainly injected in drug use and transfusion. Here are the risk factors associated with reported hepatitis A. If you notice, sexual contact or household contact is about 14%, international travel 5%, men who have sex with men 10%, injecting drug use 6%, child employing daycare 2%, food or waterborne outbreak 4%, contact of daycare child employee 6%, but 46% of cases are unknown. All right, that's important. 46% are unknown. What's also important is child or employing a daycare. If there's a hepatitis outbreak in a daycare facility, the rule is close the place down, all right? Or if there's an employee who works in a restaurant, they can't go back to work. Otherwise, you're gonna have a huge problem with people who eat at the facilities. And we have certainly had that happen in South Carolina. So most of these outbreaks occur in the context of a community-wide outbreaks, infection transmitted from person to person, households and extended family settings as facilitated by asymptomatic infection among children. Children can carry the bug and have no symptoms whatsoever, unlike adults. All right, some groups are at increased risk, and children are the most frequently infected group, and as I had pointed out before, that there's no risk factor identified in 40 to 50% of cases. Here's where hepatitis A occurs worldwide. The color in red shows the countries with the highest prevalence, so if you plan on going to any of these countries, you might want to consider a hepatitis A vaccine prior to travel. Not the day before you travel, at least four weeks before you travel, all right? A vaccine is a wonderful thing. Here on the y-axis, rate per 100,000, the x-axis, year. Um, the vaccine was licensed in 1995. You notice the high prevalence of hepatitis A that we've had. In 1996, the CDC rec ACIP recommendations to provide routine vaccine for adults, followed by the 1999, which emphasized vaccination for children, and a markedly decreased trend in the prevalence. Here is the prevalence in the United States from 1987 to 1997. Notice the colors are in red, are the areas with the highest prevalence. But look what vaccination has caused, all right? If you'd never believed in vaccination before, this definitely should convince you that it works. Okay, so the pathogenesis. Incubation is about four weeks, range from two to six weeks. Oral cavity is where the organism gets ingested. It goes to the GI tract, then the liver via blood. So that's why if the blood is not screened and someone is having a viremia, you can get hepatitis A transmitted by that route. Um, it lives in the liver cells, little damage to cells, released via bile to intestine, seven to 10 days prior to clinical symptoms. That's important because then if someone is infected, you have to go back seven to 10 days, up to two weeks prior to their becoming symptomatic because they could have been shed in the organism. <clears throat> so the acute illness is associated with a discrete onset of symptoms. Example, fatigue, 
and I don't mean medical student tired, even more tired than you can ever be, if you can imagine that, right? Abdominal pain, loss of appetite, intermittent nausea and vomiting. There's also jaundice or elevated serum aminotransferase levels, dark urine, light stool. Adults usually more symptomatic. Kids can have it and walk around and bounce off the walls and be perfectly fine. Adults get it and boom, all right? Patients are infected while they're shedding the virus in the stool, usually before the onset of symptoms, very important. Most cases result spontaneously in two to four weeks and complete recovery in 99%. It's amazing. You'll see someone with hepatitis A and they look like they're going to die any minute now. And then they recover 100%. Here's jaundice by age group, the clinical features. If you're less than six years old, the incidence is less than 10%. But if you're over 14, notice 70 to 80% of folks will have jaundice. There's some very rare complications of, with fulminant or cholestatic or relapse in hepatitis. An incubation period average 30 days, range 15 to 50 days, and no complications. I throw this slide in just because CDC loves to throw this slide in. Um, you know, and I never understood as a medical student, still don't understand as an attending. But it's really just the illness, so don't memorize it, don't, don't memorize it. But it's really just to illustrate the rise and fall of the antibodies and the antigen when someone becomes infected. Um, what I want you to take home, which is important, is if you're determining, if you're going to determine if someone is acutely infected with hepatitis A, they need to have a positive IgM. Right? So if there is a, a, an outbreak of diarrhea at your favorite restaurant, you know, and you want to know whether it's hepatitis A, you have to request a hepatitis A IgM. If you want to know whether someone has been immunized or was previously infected with hepatitis A, then you want to order IgG. Okay? So, oh, just, I'm so smart, see? It shows up. Detect IgM antibody. An IgG is positive one to three weeks later, suggests prior infection or vaccination. Very important. Supportive. There's no specific role of antiviral therapy, and lifelong immunity is likely after infection or vaccination. So you can't keep on getting hepatitis A. Once you've had it, you've had it. So if someone comes in with symptoms that are similar to hepatitis A and you have a history of being vaccinated or have had it in the past, you can move that out of your differential. Hand washing helps just about everything. I mean, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Clean water sources also helps. Hepatitis A vaccine is a pre-exposure, it's good. And there's also immunoglobulin available for folks who decide to travel to Southeast Asia tomorrow and show up at the doctor today, all right? So it's an inactivated vaccine, it's highly immunogenic. 90 to 97 to 100% of children, adolescents and adults have protective levels of antibody within within one month of receiving the first dose, essentially 100% protective levels after second dose. And in fact, if you were to show up at the doctor today and you're traveling tomorrow, the recommendation is to give you the vaccine now because it's so, it works so well that by the time you get where you're going, you would have some amount of protection as well. Um, so the first dose, the time zero now, and the second dose is six to 12 months afterwards. Do you know what happens if somebody misses the dose? Let's say they come 13 months or 14 months. What do you, hmm? mm -hmm. Start, give me another answer. You just give them the next dose, trick question. So you never start off, but you don't start the series over. You just pick up where you left off and continue. All right, simple. we're going to get to hepatitis B where there are three doses, but wherever you miss, you just start again. I mean, just start with what's remaining. Make sense? Okay. Okay, what's not recommended? So there's no post-vaccination testing because there's a high response rate among vaccinees, as well as the assay that you would use to detect whether someone has a response or not is not very good. So we know it's very efficacious. You give someone the vaccine and you wish them well. 
when does protection begins four weeks after vaccine? It's actually quite much earlier than this. Um, the persistence of antibody at least five to eight years among adults and children. Efficacy, no cases in vaccinated children at five to six years of follow-up. And this is a publication that comes out. You guys know the MMWR, right? It has all the guidelines and all the different appropriate illnesses. And it's really good to read. They come out, depending on the disease, maybe every two or three years. All right? And a lot of people come together, put their ideas together, and you have to keep up because usually the medical boards will ask you questions that are from the most recent guidelines. It's something that's good to know. But persons that increase risk for infection include travelers to intermediate and high Hepatitis A endemic countries, and remember that geographic map of the world that I showed you, those countries in red. Men who have sex with men, illegal drug users, persons who have clotting factor disorders, and persons with chronic liver disease, as well as communities with historically high rates of hepatitis A should have routine childhood vaccination. Remember that map of the United States from 1987 to 90, 1997, there were a lot of the states that were in red, meaning they had a high prevalence. Not so much now, but those places have routine hepatitis A vaccination for children. Um, the side effects associated with the vaccine are really very minimal. Most of them are injection site, about half, then followed by headaches or malaise fatigue, and no severe reactions known, and safety in pregnancy is unknown, but the risk is probably um, very minimal. So here are the recommendations. Children who should be routinely vaccinated are those living in states, counties, and communities where the average hep A rate was greater than 20 cases per 100,000 during baseline period. And children who should be considered for routine vaccination are living in states, counties, and communities where the average hep A rate was less than 20, but greater than 10 cases during the baseline period. So there's a big push to get children vaccinated. Here's for passive immunization. Hep A immune globulin can be given up to two weeks. Up to two weeks, that's important, after an exposure. Immunity is temporary, it lasts only about four or five months. Also given in travelers leaving for endemic area on short notice, that is not enough time for the vaccine to be effective. But most providers, I say, would give the vaccine anyway. <coughs> Okay, I think I touched on some of that. I should also add that since we're in South Carolina and I also work with the health department, there are certain diseases that are reportable to the health department. Hepatitis is one of them, and Hep A is the one we're talking about. And there's a time frame for reporting. Certainly acute Hepatitis A must be reported within 24 hours to the health department. And please order a Hepatitis A IgM. You'd be surprised how many times people, we get them mixed up, right? must be reported within 24 hours. So for hepatitis B, any questions so far? Good. Okay. So hepatitis B is a hepna virus. Um, and hepatitis B has all of these different particles that I'm not going to bore you to death to try to describe them and what they do. They do. And I'm, certainly you've probably had them in the past. But it's important to understand them because when you order the various serology, you're going to have to know what to order. Whether you're asking if someone has been vaccinated, are they immune, do they have acute hepatitis B, do they have a resolving infection, do they have a chronic infection. So it's one of those things that you take your book, you curl up with a TV off, and you read it over and over again. Or you get one of those little cheat sheets and I'm, I think I have one or two down that tells you the co different combinations, what the person is most likely to have. But on the, every board I've ever taken, there's always a question that comes by and it drives you crazy. What is one of those things that you have to do? Well, one of those things you have to do consistently, right? And you're not going to get it at just one sitting. But I point out that the core antigen is, and this is how the core antigen is referred to, big H, little c, little c, AG for antigen. Is also the E antigen, which is an indicator of transmissibility. Someone is highly infectious if their E antigen is positive. That's a marker for infectivity. It's a double-stranded DNA virus. 
The virus is stable and resists many stresses, making them more infectious. A lot of folks in the hospital are really worried about acquiring HIV. I would be a lot more worried about hepatitis B. Well, I'm, I'm not. I'm vaccinated. But were I not vaccinated against hepatitis B, in terms of infectivity, hepatitis B is much more infectious than HIV. In fact, it's hepatitis B first, then hepatitis C, then HIV. But everyone gets you know, histrionic when they come in contact with some blood product or body fluid about HIV, I'd be more worried about hepatitis B. That's what it looks like on micrograph. That's what it looks like. Here are the places in the world with a high prevalence of um, hepatitis B. The color in red shows the places with a very high prevalence. So when you want to spend your tuition, go travel to any of these places, make sure you get vaccinated before you go. Right. Okay, so 45% of the global population, high prevalence is a lifetime risk of infection greater than 60%, and they have very early childhood infections. For intermediate regions, which is 43% of global population, the lifetime risk of infection is 20 to 60%, and infections occur in all age groups. And in the low prevalence area, which is 12% of the global population, most infections occur in adult risk group. That would qualify as the United States. Here's another poster for to recommend vaccination. And this is from 1966 to the year 2000. The vaccine was licensed somewhere around 85, 86 here. If you notice that the downward trend that has occurred Hepatitis B surface antigen screening of pregnant women was recommended around 1992 or so, followed by inf infant immunization, an OSHA rule enacted, Occupational Safety Health Act, that says folks like us should get vaccinated and as well as universal precautions and so on. And then adolescent immunization recommended. So we've had a continued decline in the prevalence of hepatitis B, a testimony that the vaccine, if given, is very effective. How many people have been vaccinated against Hep B? All of you, right? Please. I feel good. Okay. All right. Here's the incubation period. Average 60 to 90 days, range 45 to 180 days. Incubation periods are important because if someone presents with an illness that resembles Hep B or another illness, virus or bacteria that affects the liver, it tells you it's a likely where the person probably contracted it. And, and if that's the thing that you should have your differential diagnosis or not. Um, clinical illness. If you're under five years, less than 10% will develop jaundice. If you're over five years, about 30 to 50% of people will have jaundice. And you notice it's not 100%. So you could have hepatitis B and not have jaundice, right? Just noticeable by its absence. A lot of students will think, well, the patient doesn't have jaundice, so it couldn't be hepatitis B. No, only about 50% will have it. Acute case fatality rate, about 0.5 to 1%. Notice this is different from hepatitis A. Hepatitis A doesn't kill you. It makes you very sick, but it doesn't kill you. But hepatitis B can certainly put you under, and quickly too. Um, chronic infection, if you're under five years old, the chance of a chronic infection is 30 to 90%. But if you're over five years, the chance of a chronic infection is from two to 10%, an important difference. And premature mortality from chronic liver disease, 15 to 25%. And you certainly don't want to have hepatitis B and be an alcoholic. Not a good, not a good combination. Here are the possible outcomes of hepatitis B infection. About 3 to 5% of adults acquire infections. 95% of infants acquire infections. So if, a, if you're thinking that a child is, could potentially become infected with hepatitis B, you really have to take it very serious because the vast majority of them are going to develop hepatitis B, unlike adults. In fact, if a, a child is born to a hepatitis B surface antigen mother, you do not have time to think about it, right? You have to act immediately to give him the globulin start vaccination right away before the child leaves the hospital. Chronic hepatitis B infection can become chronic hepatitis in about 12 to 25 percent of people in five years could develop into cirrhosis, which goes on to either liver failure and death, or can lead to liver transplant, or lead to hepatocellular carcinoma. Not good, not good options. Right. Okay. Here's the outcome by age, and I sort of explained some of this earlier. 
Uh, here's chronic infection here versus symptomatic infection. Notice that the younger you are, you're likely to have symptomatic, inf less likely to have symptomatic infection. When you're older, then you will have more likely to have symptomatic infection. And, you're, and I know this is a tongue twister, more or less, but if you're young, you're more likely to develop a chronic infection. And as you get older, you're less likely to develop a chronic infection. And here's another one, another one of those posters that I hate, but you sort of have to be familiar with what goes on, but don't memorize it. If you're thinking someone has acute hepatitis B, the immunoglobin you need to request is IgM anti-hepatitis B core. IgM anti-hepatitis B core. In fact, that's the only thing I want to see if I ask you for if someone has an acute hepatitis B infection is IgM core. But you notice in looking at this that all the different antibodies overlap. So at some point, someone might be acutely infected, but it could be zero, right? And so that's why it's important to know which antibodies or antigen go together to give you the diagnosis. And I'm not going to do it with this, with this um, slide. There are others there that will explain it a lot better. Okay. So the modes of transmission are sexual, parenteral, perinatal. <coughs> Let's look at the concentration of hepatitis B in various body fluids. And this I would remember, because this is also very similar to HIV. And in fact, CDC is now grouping HIV, STDs, and hepatitis in the same modes of transmission, because they are transmitted basically the same way. You know, there's very high concentration of the virus in blood, serum, and wound exudates. But then moderate amounts are found in semen, vaginal fluid, and saliva. Low or not detectable in urine, feces, sweat, tears, and breast milk. And when, we, when I speak to you on the HIV lecture, I'll tell you how HIV differs, what I can tell you now. HIV is transmitted via breast milk. It's about 15% risk of transmission. Right? HIV can be, but hasn't been documented, transmitted with sweat and tears, but definitely transmission with feces and urine. Right? In fact, the HIV test, one of them is a urine test. Okay. Let's look at risk factors associated with reported hepatitis B from 1990 to 2000. About 14% are injection drug users. Sexual contact with hepatitis B patient, about 13%. Household contact with B patient, 2%. Men who have sex with men, 6%. Medical employee, 1%. Hemodialysis, zero, which I don't believe, but it's a CDC slide, blame them. I think it's actually a little bit higher. But a lot of patients, anyone who gets dialysis should be vaccinated against hepatitis B. So maybe that's a good thing. Multiple sex partners, 17%. Another reason not to have multiple sex partners. Blood transfusion zero, this is good because the blood is screened for hepatitis B, but unknown is about 32%. Here are the symptoms. About 50 to 60% of adults with hepatitis B infection have no signs or symptoms, 50 to 60%. Those who have symptoms might experience jaundice, fatigue, abdominal pain, loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, or joint pain. And you immediately notice that these symptoms are very similar to hepatitis A, but one kills you and one won't. Here's a pathogenesis. The virus enters hepatocytes via blood. There's an immune response to the viral antigens expressed in hepatocyte cell surface. 5% become chronic carriers. That is defined as a hepatitis B surface antigen longer than six months. A higher rate of hepatocellular cancer in chronic carriers, especially those who are E antigen positive. Hepatitis B surface antibody likely confers lifelong immunity, and hepatitis B E antibody indicates low transmissibility. So there's a lot of important facts there. I'll go over them with you. If someone is E antigen positive, they're very infectious. It's an indication of transmissibility. 
if you want to look for immunity, you're going to order hepatitis B surface antibody. That comes from someone who was either infected or someone who was vaccinated against hepatitis B. And one of the feared complications of hepatitis B is hepatocellular carcinoma as well as liver failure. Whoa, oh, you can see that even better. Good, okay. So remember I said how complicated these serologic titers can be. And you know, is it fair to ask it on exams? You know, if a patient is in front of you, just open your book and you look it up. But they can't give you everything easy, so they force you to memorize these things. But the serologic markers for different phases of acute and chronic hep B virus infection, here are the serologic markers, hepatitis B surface antigen, hepatitis B E antigen, IgM anti-hepatitis B core, IgG anti-hepatitis B core, anti-hepatitis B surface, anti-hepatitis B E antigen, and hepatitis B DNA. And here's the interpretation. So if you're thinking of acute hep B infection, notice all the things that are in a positive, right? And that's early phase. But for acute infection, you definitely want to be sure that the IgM anti-core needs to be positive. Okay. For chronic hepatitis B infection, you know, I've listed the interpretation on the right-hand side, whether replicated phase, low non-replicated phase, a flare-up, or pre-core, core promoter mutants. Then I don't get that detailed, but it's, in, it's, it's one of those things that you'll not get just sitting down and looking. You have to try to get different combinations and test yourself as to what you think is the most likely diagnosis. And it's hard, but it takes some effort. And this, I try to teach you some of that. Interpretation of hepatitis B panel, the tests, the results, the interpretation. So if the hepatitis B surface antigen is negative and the anti-hepatitis B core is negative and the anti-hepatitis B surface is also negative, can anyone tell me what's the likely diagnosis? Person is susceptible. Very, you're smart, very good. So this person needs to be vaccinated, right? Let's look at the surface antigen being negative, the anti-hepatitis B core either negative or positive, if the surface antibody is positive, what does that mean? That means the person is immune, all right? The surface antibody here is positive. The person is immune. The surface antigen is positive. Anti-core is positive. IgM anti-core is positive. Anti-hepatitis B surface is negative. Acute infection. If the surface antigen is positive, the core antibody is positive, but IgM core is negative, or the surface antibody is negative, it's a chronic infection. These are the big four that you have to distinguish. And you know, you know, I would go home and cover one side and teach myself what it is, because that's what shows up in the exams. You know, someone comes in jaundice, no appetite, abdominal pain, medical student who was just learning how to draw blood, never got hepatitis B vaccine, what do you think is going on? And you say, draw blood, and here's the serology. Comes, this comes back as positive and that comes back as negative, what do you think is going on? That's the sort of questions you get asked. I think a lot of confusion comes because we oftentimes don't know what to order. So sometimes you order, you know, surface antigen and core, and you have no idea how to put them together. So you have to, in your mind, tell yourself, what are you asking? Are you asking if this is a, an acute infection? Are you asking if it's a chronic infection? Or, you, or are you asking if the person was vaccinated? Right? Based on the question you're asking, that should direct which of the serology you, you order. Now, Medicaid, Medicare, and insurance company don't want you to order all of them, right, because it costs money, right? They want you to select, based on what you're thinking, order the labs that support it. But to make your life even more confusing, here's a fourth category. Surface antigen negative, 
anti-hepatitis B core positive and surface negative, what does that mean? Four possible interpretations, right? Perfect day, right? So that's when you get your book out and you call your buddy and you say, well, what could it be? If the surface antigen is negative and the core antibody is positive and the surface antibody is negative, it could be that the person is recovering from an acute infection or maybe distantly immune and test is not sensitive enough to detect very low level of surface antibody in the serum or the person may be susceptible with a false positive core antibody or the person may be undetectable, may have undetectable level of surface antigen present in the serum and the person is actually a carrier. But if I were you, I would focus on these. Susceptible, immune, acute, and chronic. I think if you master these four, you'd be well off. Okay. So how do we prevent hepatitis B infection? I think one strategy certainly is perinatal, is to prevent perinatal transmission since kids can become chronically infected. Um, routine vaccination of all infants, vaccination of children in high-risk groups, when to vaccinate adolescents and all children through age 18, and vaccination of adults in high-risk groups. The vaccine is a recombinant vaccine. It was licensed in 1982, a year after I was born. I, an applause. <laughs> Nobody believes me, right? But it's a two-dose series. Peter believes me. It's a two-dose series. Licensed by FDA for 11 to 15 year olds. There's a, a 30 to 50% protection with the first dose, this is important, 75% after the second dose, and 96% after the third dose. The protection level, this is important, is lower if you're Peter's age in the older group. If you're immunosuppressed, if you have HIV, chronic liver diseases, diabetes, obese, or smokers. All right. So the protection is important because oftentimes you tell a patient, you get the first dose today and you say, come back and get the second dose, three, six, if you use that schedule, and they don't show up, All right? And they might come in ill subsequently. You wonder, could this be hep B? Well, you'll feel more confident if they got three, right? But if they got only one, it does foster some amount of it, protection. So the question I'd asked before, that if the patient got the first dose, and never came back until two or three years later, the subsequent dose. You start off and you give the second dose, and then you follow up with the third dose according to the time schedule that you've chosen. All right, does that make sense? Wonderful. Um, this is, uh-oh. Um, because when the studies that they've done, they, you're able to mount an immune response. It, it stimulates your immune system and it, you know, you, it's a matter of getting your titers up. It doesn't seem to fall off that quickly. In fact, you know, there's some people who don't mount a detectable response at all. They, you know, so there's some healthcare workers who we do post serology follow up mm -hmm. and they don't seroconvert. But the studies show that they never become infected with hepatitis B when exposed. So I said a real reason, I don't think we know, but we know it's effective if you just pick up. Yeah. But it's important to know because a lot of times patients or yourselves will forget when your appointment was and never came back until a year or two later. Learning too that the vaccine is not as effective in groups that are immunosuppressed. There are a lot of immunosuppressed groups around and the HIV population, for example. So they might have gotten vaccinated and you would think, well, gee, if they got vaccinated against hepatitis B, then if they're sick now with those symptoms, then it's probably not hepatitis B. Not true. Could still be hepatitis B, unlike you and me, right? Because they might not have had a response at all. You see the difference? So someone who's, you know, on dialysis, diabetes, obese, smokers, HIV, you really want to think about hepatitis B, if they come in with symptoms that are consistent with the disease, regardless of whether they were vaccinated or not. In fact, those patients get a higher dose of vaccine, and certainly dialysis patients get a higher dose of the vaccine. And for HIV-infected patients, you certainly don't want to give any vaccine if the T-cell count, CD4 count, is under 200. Because if you have no CD4 count, 
you can't form antibodies. So if you're given a vaccine, right, makes no sense. So the vaccine is administered to over 12 million infants and children in the United States. Side effects rare. So if your patients are worried about something's going to happen to them when they get vaccinated, tell them relax. But there is anaphylaxis, about one in 600,000 doses. So if someone passes out, don't walk away thinking they're going to get better. All right, you may want to do something immediately. All right. There's been a lot of talk about association between, you know, vaccines and MS or autism or autoimmune disease. So far, at least for Hep B, there's been no association found. So we do give routine infant vaccination for Hep B. The kids who missed, weren't born during that period, we're doing catch-up vaccinations. The Vaccine for Children program gives the vaccine free. If you're my age, a little bit over 18, but not high risk, well, I am, occupational healthcare workers, I have been vaccinated. The hemodialysis patients should be vaccinated. All STD clinic clients, multiple sex partners or prior STDs, inmates in correctional settings, men who have sex with men, intravenous drug use, and medical school, I mean, institution for developmentally disabled folks. Okay, <laughs> should be vaccinated. <laughs> so my friends think when I spend so many years in school. <laughs> Pre-vaccination testing if it's cost effective, only if it's cost effective. That is, if someone comes in and say, I want a hepatitis B vaccine, can you test me to see if I've had the disease before? Depending on your population, what the prevalence is in your population, you decide whether pre-vaccination testing makes sense or not, right? Post-vaccination testing, notice the time, one to two months after the last shot, if established in response, and that's critical in healthcare workers. Okay? So healthcare workers are one group that you definitely want to do post-vaccination testing. But don't vaccinate today and have the patient come back on Monday. They need to give their body time to have a response. Okay. Notice that the coverage for hepatitis B vaccine, once routine infant vaccination started, is really very good. It's two thousand, the year 2002, really very good. It's almost like 80, 90 percent. This is CDC data. Schools have rules and regulation. And just about all the states, except, should we point them out? Alabama, West Virginia, Maine, where's this? Kansas, South Dakota, and, well, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> and Montana. Here's South Carolina. All those schools do not have no school entry laws for hepatitis B vaccine. Who's from Montana? Good. <laughs> There's nobody there. Okay, so bar barriers. <laughs> from there, oops. So what are some of the barriers? And these barriers probably apply to every vaccination program. And for those of you who are interested in public health, these issues come up a lot. So no funding. It's easy to say, go get a vaccine and vaccinate everyone. If there's no, vac if there's no money to pay for the vaccine, it ain't gonna happen, right? Um, lack of integrated services at sites where persons at risk are seen. Leadership and staff commitment and buy-in of resources. So it's one thing if you get your dialysis over here, but you get your vaccine over there, right? It just won't happen. Think how many times you get lost trying to find a building on campus, much less a patient, right? Um, the site's not enrolled in the vaccine for children, so the program that provides the vaccine for free, if you have to buy it on your own, it's a lot of money, right? Uh, I think one shot for us, I think we paid about $60. $60 US, not Jamaican, $60 US dollars, all right? Lack of resources for pre-vaccination counseling, vaccine administration, tracking series completion. There's also a problem with compliance with the three-dose vaccine series. But remember, very important, one dose is better than none. And if somebody says, if somebody comes to your office and say, you know, gee, I'm going away to wherever, and I don't know if I'll ever come back, it's better you give them one. Because I know we get very hard nosed and we go, you need three, you've got to come back. No, give one, and if you can give two, even better, all right? And the treatment options for hepatitis B, important, it's pegylated interferon, lamivudine, and adefavir. Interferon 
Think of the worst drug you can ever possibly think of in terms of side effects. Interferon is worse, <laughs> all right? Just any side effect you could possibly think of, interferon does it. What pegylating the interferon does is instead of getting the medicines and intravenous, it's a subcutaneous injection, instead of getting it daily, pegylating the interferon, you can get it TIW three times a week. But it's a horrible, horrible drug. Not very, very effective, but it's all we have until one of y'all do some research and come up with a better drug. Lamipidine is an NNRTI, and it's also used in HIV treatment, and so is um, adepovir. Passive immunization, inoffensive surface antigen positive mothers definitely should get immunoglobulin. That's considered an emergency. It has to be handled acutely. That's very important. Exposures to infected blood or infected body fluids in individuals who are unvaccinated, unknown vaccination, or known non-responders. Notice the three groups. You want to give immunoglobulin to people who are unvaccinated, unknown vaccination, or known non-responders. Now, if you're going to try to figure out their serology and you have to send it out and it's going to take three weeks to come back, go ahead and give the immunoglobulin. That's essentially what I'm saying. Ideally within 24 hours, probably not effective seven days post-exposure. That's critical. That this scenario will, will come up in real life. So, because I'm in public health, I have to throw this in. Notice that acute hepatitis B is reportable to the health department within 24 hours. Chronic hepatitis B is also reported within seven days and perinatal hep B is reportable within seven days. Each state has its requirements, its public health reporting requirements. These are the ones for South Carolina. But I bet you just about all the states have hepatitis B on their disease reporting list. I'm gonna do hepatitis D quickly and then we can go on break. Here's hepatitis D. It's a defective virus that requires co-infection with hepatitis B for replication. It's an envelope virus with a single strand RNA genome and the only antigen encoded in the Delta region. It's a caricature. Here's how it's transmitted, percutaneous, injecting drug use, or permucosal, sexual contact. Here's the geographic distribution with the color in red is the highest. Somewhere here in South America, parts of Africa, and I don't know what this country is. This is this Greece? No, it's too far. Somewhere over there, somewhere near Iraq. Oh, that, maybe that's Afghanistan. No, no, that's Afghanistan. Where's this, Turkey? It's somewhere not here. It's <laughs> Eastern, thank you, bless you. <laughs> it's <laughs> pathogenesis. It's immune mediated. Here's what you should know for your exam. It's immune co-infection. That's infection hit B at the same time is more severe. Superinfection, which is acquisition of hepatitis D in a chronically infected hepatitis B. So co-infection is what you don't want. It's more severe. Clinical features. So co-infection, severe acute disease, but a low risk of chronic infection. Compared to superinfection, which usually develop with chronic hepatitis D infection, and it has a higher risk of severe chronic liver disease. So in one case, the acute disease is bad, and in the other case, higher risk for severe chronic liver disease. Try to remember the distinction between those two. Okay, I'll stop here. You have a question? Okay, let me go through this. This will probably explain a little bit better. With superinfection, it means you have a persistent hepatitis B. You have pre-existing hepatitis B, right? As opposed to co-infection, you get them at the same time. Do you understand the distinction? In one case, you already have hepatitis B, and then you get hepatitis D. And in the other case, you get them both at the same time. Uh-oh. The next slide. B, hepatitis B. 
So it's a hepatitis delta virus D to get. So hepatitis D does not delta does not occur by itself. It, it, it's, it, it, the hepatitis B is almost like a helper virus. It has components of it that helps hepatitis D to replicate. So you need to either get them together at the same time or have hepatitis B existing and then acquire hepatitis D later. Any other questions? Good. All right, see you in 30 seconds.